Um, I hope you've had a nice drink and met all your old friends. Uh, this is part two, and we, we have a, a panel to discuss what we, um, what we learned in the first half. Uh, on, my <coughs> on my right is um, uh, Jim Nicholl, who's a criminal lawyer representing the families uh, of those who were killed by the police in the Marikana, at the Marikana strike. Uh, and he's pre previously he's worked closely on Bridgewater, Wallace and Rowe, uh, with investigative journalist Paul Foote and Margaret Wren. And he also represented uh, Arthur Scargill in the miners' strike in 1984 and 85, uh, and had uh, clients in the Bloody Sunday inquiry as well. And next to him is Dr. Desney Massey, who's an analyst of geopolitical economy uh, and a client manager for Southern Africa at Africa Matters Limited. Uh, and she was also the corporate relationship <laughs> manager at the Royal African Society. And we were very sad to lose her. Um, uh, and as a uh, senior editor of the Financial Mail in Johannesburg. And on my left is Andrew Feinstein, who's a writer campaigner. I'm sure you all know him. He's a, he was a former MP in, in South Africa. Uh, and he's the author of After the Party, a, a personal political inside journey uh, inside the ANC, and a, a great fat book, which will break your foot if you drop it, called, it just shows how, <coughs> how much stuff there is out there. <laughs> it's called um, Sh The Shadow World Inside the Global Arms Trade and I highly recommend it. And a surprise uh, speaker, which we're, who we're absolutely delighted to have, Jabu Sibeko, who is the chairperson of the African National Congress uh, in the UK, and is a trainer and educator. So welcome our panel, please. Jim, would you like to, to start and tell us uh, your take on Marikana? <coughs> on the 16th of August, 2012, 34 miners were shot dead by machine gun rifles capable of discharging 600 rounds per minute. They were on strike for a living wage. They lived in poverty and they lived in shacks. 14 were shot in the back. Four were shot in the back of the head. 32 out of 34 were shot above the waist. It was claimed by the police that they were shot in self-defense because they were attacking the police lines. Uh, I've yet to understand how 14 people can be shot in the back uh, when they're attacking police lines. It simply did not happen. The government set up a commission, and the commission has now reported. There are some good things in the commission's report, but the underlying theme contained in the report is really quite shocking. I don't propose to read you the whole of the report, but I'm going to read you the bit that shocked me because it is the first paragraph of the report that deals with the underlying cause of the killings. The tragic events that occurred during the period 12 to 16th August 2012 originated from the decision and conduct of the strikers in embarking on an unprotected strike and enforcing by violence and intimidation using dangerous weapons for the purpose. I know of no miner who held an R5 machine gun rifle capable of discharging 600 rounds. Let me just read one other small bit as it gets to the end uh, of it, which is at the end of the report. This report would not be complete without a condemnation in the strongest terms of the violent manner in which the strike was sought to be enforced and the brutality of the attacks upon those persons who suffered injuries and who died prior to the 16th of August. And in between, if there are 2,000 paragraphs here, I'm telling you that there are 500 paragraphs that blame the miners who were on strike and the miners who died. The disgraceful thing is this is that in order to arrive at the conclusion that the police had reasonable grounds for believing that their lives were in fear at the time that they pulled the trigger, Farlam says, well, they must have been in fear because look at the miners, they're violent. That was against the run of evidence. Nobody who pulled a trigger at scene one where you see these machine guns going off gave any evidence at all to the commission in fact, not a single person who pulled the uh, trigger came to the commission uh, to give evidence. And so for me, 
that is a very, very disappointing uh, report uh, that has come in uh, from Farlam. So I want to make my position uh, perfectly clear because I represented the 34 families of those people uh, who, who were killed are there. The killings occur as a result of the collusion between an ANC government and big business in the form of London. They came together to use the police to break the strike. My opinion is based very much upon the evidence that came before the Farlam Commission. It is tragic that Farlam could not actually see what happened to the miners through the eyes of the miners. He saw it through authority. And of course, authority wants people to be treated fairly. You know, if you have force, then you must do something about the police. But what he couldn't do was to see it through the eyes of the miners, nor could he take on board that there might be some form of collusion. In the case of Lonman, the evidence shows that they were never, ever going to talk to the miners who were on strike. That even before there was one single march, they were on the telephone to the special advisor of the Northwest Premier saying, get the police down here. Lonman had watched a little bit earlier in the year another big mining platinum house have a strike that lasted many weeks in which there was some violence, but the strikers were at the end of the day ultimately successful. Lonman didn't want to pay out those wages and it thought with the assistance of the government, with the assistance of the police, they would have a short, sharp strike. That's Lonman's motive. The ANC's motive, or the government motive, again, was they didn't want contagion. They didn't want the miners to win because then that argument for a living wage would spread through other industries and other parts of the coal field. That is precisely what happened. Precisely what happened after the killings. It went through the rest of the, mi the mining fields, gold, coal, and uh, platinum, and into other industries such as the car industry and the like. They had that reason. The second reason uh, is the question of investor confidence. And the third reason is that the union, which is part of the government through Kasatu, the TUC of South Africa, was losing members hand over fist to the new union on the block, and that was called AMCU. So they had reasons to come together in order to nation. As to what morning of the 16th, that Colonel Classens rings the mortuary and says, I want four mortuary vans, each van capable of holding four bodies. I want them sent up to Marikana because today we're going to take the miners down that came in from the people uh, who run the mortuary van uh, service down at, the, down at the morgue. It doesn't explain uh, <coughs> or, that again in the morning, long before the killings, 4,000 rounds of machine gun ammunition extra were ordered into Marikana. So they knew that there was going to be the killings. They simply knew it was going to do it. They were going to take down uh, the, the miners. Some of the findings of the Farlam Commission are not bad when it comes to the police. But even when it comes to the police, it is the cock-up theory of history rather than the deliberate act. It is bad management, bad communications, the radios weren't working, people didn't talk to each other. I think it was completely different. I think the evidence shows that what, they were going to happen, what was going to happen that day is that the miners on strike were going to be given a good hiding come hella high water and they were going to be done by, uh, that was high, sorry, the good hiding was going to be given to them by 718 police officers who had arrived on, st on, the, on the site armed to the teeth. The findings run against the evidence in relation to uh, Ramaphosa and the government. It's difficult in the few minutes I've got uh, to say that, but we perhaps we'll be able to come back to it. And I'm deeply disappointed that uh, Ramaphosa, Matetwa, uh, and one or two others were not charged with murder. I think that, or recommended to be charged with murder. I think the evidence uh, is there. But the main finding, the underlying cause, is really perverse. Finally, I say this. The legacy of Marikana, the legacy of Marikana extends much more than this commission. South Africa will never be the same. There is, for the very first time in 20 years in post-apartheid South Africa, an independent trade union called AMCU who does not take its orders from the government. 
that the TUC in the form of Kasatu is breaking up and its biggest union, the Manual Workers Union, NUMSA, is breaking and has been expelled from Kasatu. The economic freedom fighters, which have left wing type organizers. I totally agree that South Africa will never be the same again. Marikana was a seismic event, not just in terms of the scale of 2012. And in this ratings out, um, action, they actually have cited growing investor awareness of socioeconomic inequality in South Africa and how this was heightened by the events in the mining sector. <coughs> Now, the living conditions at Marikana were flagged up to Lonman PLC by their own corporate advisors. Um, in my doctorate, I, I did um, it on corporate reputation, and I spoke to somebody who actually did advise Lonman. They were told as early as 2009 to look at the situation with the living conditions, to monitor the, the time bomb ticking with AMCU, but they didn't listen to their own paid advisors, which is, which is striking. And not only did Lonman not take action on the social conditions and the labor relations at the mine, at the time of the strike, the two representatives of Lonman earned as, as all 3,000 striking drill operators. So there's a story here as well about egregious executive pay and how that is also undermining our social systems. In addition, Lonman claimed that it could not make the payments in regard to its obligations to social housing because of the global financial crisis. However, evidence at the inquiry demonstrated that um, Lonman had paid over 600 million US dollars in the period 2007 to 2011. And there's also allegations that profits may have been shifted to tax havens in Bermuda and the tax haven of the City of London Corporation. But this also points a finger at the which Jack um, mentioned um, in his talk. The IFC, which is the investment arm of the World Bank, has a 0.6% um, stake in Lonman, and tied to this is a very strong ethos of corporate social responsibility. Just yesterday, the Financial Times uh, reported that there's the women's group at Marikana. They are actually taking the IFC to the World Bank Ombudsman and asking why the IFC has failed on these obligations. So as I said, the events at Marikana are watershed for corporate social responsibility. It has thrown up um, how corporate citizens should have an awareness of the contribution to CSR, not only towards sustainability, but actually it contributes to long-term profitability. So it means if you consider on the same platinum belt, there are two tribes, uh, the Real Bafakeng and Bakhatla Bakhafela. Now, these, um, the chiefs of these tribes have um, taken the platinum holdings of these people on this land the investment holdings of the Bahatla, for example, total 8.2 billion rand, and it's those dividends are reinvested back into the community and social projects. So, so why does corporate social responsibility have to be mutually exclusive from profitability? I think this is the question we have to ask ourselves. Jim also highlighted the potentially toxic confluence between business and South Africa. In South Africa, the president of South Africa, Cyril Ramaphosa, was a director of Lonman at the time. He's now being cleared of any um, guilt relating to the murders that day. Um, but certainly a question mark needs to be raised about entrepreneurship in South Africa <coughs> and the black oligarchy. And how is it that an executive in a corporation can have a hotline to a police commissioner and influence the outcome of events during a strike? I'll just end off by saying um, that since these events, investor sentiment has worsened on the back of the Moody's rating action. As a result, economic growth in South Africa is flatlining, are holding back on um, investing into South Africa until there can be clarity on how some of these things will be sorted out. As a result, poverty and socioeconomic inequality will only worsen. I mean, so ultimately, there needs to be a very serious conversation about um, corruption in business and politics and how multinational investment can address developmental <coughs> challenges in, um, South in, in South Africa and developing countries in general. Jay, sorry, Jack mentioned phone and the fact that we all carry around mobile devices <coughs> with platinum in them. There's, again, there's no reason that CSR technology can't take place without um, conflict minerals in them. Fairphone monitors supply chains and <coughs> provides a very good smartphone at a reasonable cost. And yeah, 
So, I mean, I'll just conclude with that. Um, I hope that was useful. Does IFC still have a stake in Medical? It, it didn't. The women's group. Did they make any statement? Did they? Um, well, I, as far as I, I know the story today is that the women's group at Marikana mm -hmm. has raised it with the World Bank's ombudsman. So that case hasn't happened yet. The complaint was made recently. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. 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 Andrew. Thank you. <laughs> um, for those of you who haven't seen it, um, the film Miners Shot Down is how I experienced Marikana, as many of us in the United Kingdom did. And for anyone in this room who hasn't seen it, please, when you get home, Google it and get yourself a copy. Because it brings home in an extraordinarily raw manner the brutality that took place, the way in which these striking miners who were fighting for a living wage, who were fighting for a decent life, were pursued and gunned down. The vengeance with which the strike leader who urinated in front of the police vehicle the night before the massacre, the vengeance with which he was hunted down in his hiding place, and shot can only be understood when you see that footage. And Marikana and that footage speaks to the tragedy of today's South Africa. South Africa is not a basket case. We have these very easy ways of characterizing Africa, of characterizing the global South, and it's too easy to fall into that narrative. The tragedy of the young South African democracy is how quickly we adopted the tawdry norms of global politics. And that's really what Jack was speaking to at of this conversation. It is crucial to understand the context in which Marikana happened, to understand in the symbol, the person of Cyril Ramaphosa, who was Secretary General of the National Workers during the most intense years of the struggle against apartheid, who in the lead up to the Marikana massacre as a non-executive director of Lonmen, emailed, telephoned, and engaged with his comrades in the ANC, and told them that it is urgent for the sake, not of Lonmen, but for the sake of South Africa and the South African economy, that this strike be dealt with and be dealt with urgently. Cyril, the man I met as Secretary General of the National Government of Mine Workers in Johannesburg, is very likely to be South Africa's next president. To replace our current president, who a few weeks before he was elected president, faced 783 counts of fraud, corruption, and racketeering in relation to a massively corrupt arms deal. This is what has become of my ANC. This is what has become of the ANC of Mandela, Susulu, Lutuli. And yes, of course, the individuals are to blame because it's been allowed to. And I, having served in the ANC government for seven and a half years, am partly complicit in that. My real fear is that I don't believe that events like this can happen without some awareness of the very small group of politicians around Jacob Zuma who run South Africa. And my real fear is that now with the breakaway of NUMSA from Kasatu, 
the formation of the so-called progressive unions, the creation of something called the United Front, which will be formally launched in December of this year, on the one hand, to the left of the ANC, presenting the interests of the unemployed, the workers who are so struggling to make a living wage, and the emergence, perhaps, of a slightly different center-right opposition in the Democratic Alliance, that if the ANC's grip on power starts to loosen, my real fear is that Marikana will have been the first, not the last. Thank you. Jabu, would you like to try and address some of these points? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thank you very Please. much. The uh, floor is yours. And good evening, everyone. And I'm sure this, uh, this comes very, very interesting because uh, I suspect that and, uh, at some point I may have to probably make a very clear distinction, which I'm just going to start with, is that there is a significant difference between the ANC in government and the ANC out of government. And I'm the chairperson of the African National Congress. I'm not part of the government. And I actually picked up right from the beginning there's a resonating theme between the political and the corporate uh, dynamic in which I cannot account for. It, I mean, I know in the ANC we are the ones who have uh, set up and will continue to do so, notwithstanding you know, some people who are kind of like have taken advantage of some of the unfortunate circumstances that have happened in the country. And I must clearly state that, I mean, in the ANC, we regret the incidents of Marikana. And those were the unfortunate incidents that led to the deaths of a number of people. That's regrettable. It's unacceptable. And as the African nation, we don't condone those acts. And we accept that a commission of inquiry was set up to address those issues. And as you've stated earlier on, I think the report is about 500 and something pages. I haven't read the whole report, but I probably have picked up in some of the bits and pieces of the report. And I was not following the commission the, uh, uh, when it said, but then I do understand that due processes were followed. And some people were not brought to account as they were actually, actually supposed to have come to account. But then, I mean, having said that, um, I do accept that it was a very, very unfortunate incident that happened. And in the, I mean, as a member of the African National Congress, I'm not going to justify how the government dealt with that uh, incident. But I may, I will say that the ANC definitely condemned that act of violence towards the minors, because. My understanding, it was a very, very tragic and a very embarrassing incident that happened in South Africa post uh, apartheid. I think these are type of uh, events that actually happened during the apartheid era. And I mean, in that new dispensation, which was a democratic dispensation, it is just unfortunate that that incident had to happen within, within the country. And we accept in South Africa that, at, in, in the ANC, that we still have a huge problem. I think there's still a huge legacy of, uh, that was left by the apartheid that we are still dealing with. There are still a significant amounts of poverty. There is a lot of inequalities that prevail in the country. And there's huge unemployment that prevails in the country. The government has a responsibility to try and deal with that. And we in the ANC, we are the ones who kind of like driving the government to address those issues, because those are the issues that affect the constituencies of, 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 of the South Africans. And I think let me stop in there then and see if we can get responses from yeah. that. All right. <coughs> Let's have some questions, a host of, of hands. I'll, I'll start with the gentleman over here. Thank you, Chairman. I hope I'm going to be the could first. You, could you give us your name, please? Yes, my name is Nigel Bruce. I hope I'm going to be the first to be able to welcome Andrew to member of the Democratic Alliance. <laughs> if not, if, <laughs> <laughs> if that is too rich for him, maybe the Lib Dems. 
would be. Uh, would I'm not be sure which is worse, Nigel. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, <laughs> <laughs> I, I must say, uh, when listening to the representative of the ANC here, whom I don't know, I mean, I've heard the sort of arguments that he put forward so often uh, from the apartheid government in South Africa during the years before, and I've heard it from those Germans who were once Nazis and are now no longer Nazis. Uh, it's an old statement where suddenly a party that has gone awfully bad turns around and says, but it was not our fault after all. It is your fault. The fact that there is nearly 40% unemployment in South Africa is your fault. Nobody else's fault. It's the fault of the government of the ANC. And until you accept that, the country is not going to get the foreign investment which it so vitally needs. Thank you, Chairman. Okay. All right. Let's comment. Uh, yes, uh, the. Uh, yeah, the, the, the gentleman here in the pink shirt is <laughs> Barry Moody. Hi. Um, I, I heard several people say that uh, Marikana would be a watershed. Um, uh, sorry to be skeptical, but I think a lot of us have been saying, have been, those of us who have reported on South Africa have been puzzled tragically for many years about why the ANC government, you know, why the ANC, which clearly has betrayed the legacy of Mandela, still manages to take such a dominant role in politics and get such a dominant uh, percentage of the vote in South Africa. Is it the <coughs> failure of the opposition? What is it? I, I find this just completely astonishing. And every time I've covered an election in South Africa, I've expected some sign that the population that has not been given the legacy of post-apartheid would react against the ANC, and it doesn't. So is there any hope? because of this traditional and um, historic uh, loyalty of the population, the black population, to the ANC, which you can understand in a historical way, but you can't understand in a modern sense, will this ever end, and will, will the ANC be kicked out of power because of what they have done? Okay. And, yeah, if, if you could pass the, uh, the, the microphone to the left. Um, the end of apartheid came in 1993, but that wasn't really the end of apartheid as a whole. Because what we have in South Africa now is a pure and simple economic apartheid, where you have the rich and the ex-revolutionaries who become part of the establishment and part of the <coughs> multinational companies who are doing what the apartheid regime, the white South African apartheid regime was doing then. It is disgraceful to stay, sit there and say that the cards that are below the ANC, running the ANC, have no say in what people that are in the hierarchy of the ANC are doing. Okay. Uh, I've, uh, Jabu, would, do you want to pick up on, on, those, on those questions? What I can say is, um, basically, I'm, I'm I'm not surprised. I mean, I mean, some of them they are fair comments, mm -hmm. you know, and and I'm not surprised. I mean, it's very highly uh, likely that I mean, um, the condemnation would actually go towards the government, and I quite accept that there's been a lot of discrepancy in the government itself, and there's a lot that the government hasn't achieved, which it has earmarked to achieve um, <coughs> by duration of time. We accept that we are a young democracy. And I mean, post-1994, for an example, it's not that the people actually gained you know, the economic freedom of the country. They actually gained the, pol uh, the, you know, the political freedom, the power to vote. And there was a number of institutions that needed to be changed. You know, the Mandela era, for an example, it was the era for national reconciliation. You know, and when Tabum Beki took on the, rel uh, the realms of presidency, that was about uh, 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 beginning to address, rewrite the policies of the country that are actually going to affect uh, 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 benefit the majorities of the country. And even today, they actually have not been filtered out by echelons of the society. I mean, yes, there are, there are certain benefits, but unfortunately is that, I mean, whoever would be commenting would not be commenting on, the, on some of the achievements that the government has achieved. I think we've, there's a lot that has been done in terms of improving the education for children and access to education, particularly tertiary education. There's a lot of housing that has actually been produced by the government. People never had houses. They live in shacks. I'm not suggesting that shacks are no longer there. 
But if you go all over, there, there's, uh, there, there are houses that are being built by the government, and it continues to do so. There is infrastructure development that is going on, I mean, which are initiative of the government. You know, they have developed uh, international relationship with other governments and other businesses to ensure that, I mean, yes, some incidents have actually dented the investor confidence in South Africa, but South Africa, uh, uh, the ANC will continue to work with the government in ensuring that we still, you know, uh, develop means and, and resources to address issues of, uh, uh, South, uh, of South Africa. I mean, it's still a young democracy. We can't compare ourselves with advanced democracies. And it's not going to be achieved overnight. We accept that. And I think it's imperative that, I mean, that's fine. I'm, I'm saying it's imperative that, I mean, we are sitting in here. We, we have to listen. We're not going, there's no magic, there's no magic wand about it. We have to listen and accept that if there are faults, we need to build on that. Okay. Who else would like, uh, Andrew, you had just, a just comment. To pick up on all three questions at, at one level, I think it's important to understand that for a lot of South Africans, particularly black South Africans, the ANC is more than a political party. I mean, for many people, it was the place of family, even of church. Um, and of course, it was seen as leading the liberation struggle. And I think it does take a long time for that to evolve. I mean, I, I sit in the United <coughs> Kingdom, and I find it completely baffling that people can re-elect a Tory government yeah. when they know the pain that it's going to inflict on them. <coughs> um, so, you know, this is not unique to South Africa. Um, but I think that because of, of the nature of a liberation struggle, there is, a, there is an added dimension to it, an added element to it. And I think one of the weaknesses of our democracy in the last 20 years has been, um, I'm sorry to say this, Nigel, but I think that there has been a very weak opposition. And I'm not blaming individuals or parties. I think that the DA um, has done some very good things, um, particularly in the parliamentary. But unfortunately, there's been a glass ceiling to the DA's ability to, to win votes and to be an electoral player. Hopefully, that will now change with the election of their first leader who is not white. And it'll be very interesting to see whether it's able to break through that glass ceiling and actually represent the interests of more than the privileged in South Africa. I think the developments to the ANC's left are perhaps even more interesting. Um, I think that the economic freedom fighters, Julius Malema, and the fact that it's won about a million votes is extraordinary, given that Malema himself, while in the ANC, was as corrupt and as much a tendepreneur as the people he's now criticizing. But I do think that, that this movement now um, emerging from the trade unions, um, the United Front, could really start to recalibrate South Africa's politics. But it is going to take a long time. Yeah. Desney, you wanted to... Yes, yeah, so I just wanted to pick up on the gentleman here's point and on what Andrew's talking about, the share of the ANC's vote at this time. In the 2014 election, the DA increased its vote to 23%. The EFF took 6% of South Africa's votes. Now. The EFF doesn't have uh, very clear policies. There's been some infighting within the EFF as well, so that share of the vote will likely unravel. The split within the left was highlighted with NUMSA's departure from Kasatu and expulsion of Vavi earlier this year. So it'll be interesting to see is if the tripartite alliance holds. It probably will into the next election. But I think if the DA can take its vote up to as much as 30%, I don't think that's an unlikely scenario for South Africa in the next five years. That will be a very positive development for opposition politics. OK, let's have some more questions. Yes, the lady here. Um, hi, thanks for a great panel. Uh, just to speak a little bit more about the um, developments to the left of the ANC, um, you were both talking about NUMSA, the national uh, uh, Union of Metal Workers of South Africa and um, the United Front. Um, I'd just love to hear a little bit more about that and what you think. And just to add that I'm doing a little bit of work with them and we're going to be arranging a trip for Urban Jim and Vavi to come to the UK. So I'd love to connect them with whoever would be interested. Um, they just went to the East Coast to sort of make some uh, connections there. Not to pitch that, but just to say I'd love to hear more about what you think. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, yes. Um. Uh, hi there. So I've, I've already 
had the mic for a very long time, so I'm going to be I'm going to be very brief. Um, but I, I just want to thank our, our our friend here for for turning up in what you probably was going to be a, a largely <laughs> hostile uh, audience and I, and I don't mean that sarcastically at all I, I appreciate that attempt at engagement and I think um, and I, I hope you'll agree with me it's a shame that President Zuma didn't show the same respect to the survivors of the Marikana massacre and the families of the victims in the way he chose to release the report with no notice, with no kind of prior uh, c capacity for, the, for those people to kind of have a look and digest its contents. I think that was a despicable act by, by him and the ANC government. And, um, and I, I, it would be great to hear your thoughts on it. But my question to you, uh, and to the panel generally, but as you've put yourself up here as uh, something of a sacrificial lamb, um, you know, Marikana is one of a long line of state massacres in, in South Africa's history. And in each case, for me anyway, uh, you know, Sharpeville in, 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 in 1960, Soweto in 76, in each case a demand which appeared on the face of it superficially to be relatively isolated, uh, the, the administration of the past laws, the teaching of Africa, African language uh, as the language of instruction in schools and in this case the demands of rock drill operators to be paid a living wage led to violence in part because they weren't just superficial isolated demands they threatened to bring to light and unpick a si much wider system of exclusion they threatened to illuminate some fundamental dynamics about the state of South Africa at that moment now what is it that you think the rock drillers uh, in Marikana asking for 12,500 rand, uh, just a decent amount to be able to afford a, a basic standard of living for themselves and their families. Why did that threaten the state and, and the status quo in Marikana? Because from the way I see it, a country which under 20 years of ANC stewardship, gross national wealth has tripled and at the same time life expectancy on average has dropped by 13 years, the number of people living on under a dollar a day has doubled. That is what it threatens. It threatens a system in which a privileged elite in South Africa under ANC stewardship have amassed fabulous riches and others have slipped into poverty. And in that context, there is no room for words like embarrassment and there's no room for words like unfortunate. There are room, there's room for words like murder and massacre and responsibility and accountability and justice. And the language you've used, which is very passive about these events having taken place, th when policemen pulled the triggers, that wasn't a passive act, it was an active act. And those policemen are in the employ of the government and that government is run by the ANC. And you talk consistently about South Africa being a young democracy and we all accept that. The way you address it is as if the democracy is along a road to greater democracy. But the way I see it is that you know, the ANC's Freedom Charter said that the people shall govern, but the domain over which the people can govern is shrinking and shrinking under neoliberalism, fundamentalism, under the very policies that the ANC is pushing through in South Africa. And that is what I think we need to address, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Okay. Well, there's a question at the back there. I just want to build on your point really quickly. You've got 34 dead bodies, and they are the result of state action. I'm wondering, what are the options for accountability in this circumstance? But beyond what the options are for accountability, what do the families of victims want here? What do they understand in terms of justice, redress, and accountability? And how is it possible? Um, through the different types of interventions that have occurred to date to, to make those things more of a reality. Okay, all right. Who would like to pick up on those questions? The well, I can deal with the families. I mean, yeah, the, <coughs> the miners themselves are migrant workers that come from a different part of South Africa, a thousand kilometers away, usually uh, in the Eastern Cape. Uh, so the families have very bravely come and uh, two and a half years uh, in Johannesburg uh, in, the, in, the, in their quest for justice and they came from nowhere and now there are people who stand up uh, and fight. Uh, what they do not believe is that their husbands uh, or their sons or their loved ones uh, were killers and what they can't see in the uh, Marikana Commission report uh, is any indication as to why they were killed. They said it simply does not provide any answers uh, and I 
think that what will happen is that there will be a campaign that will go on quite a long time, uh, which will be dominated by the women. Uh, let me just say this about the families. You know, they, they come up you know, to, this, uh, to this area, and the first Christmas in 2012, we had this terrible, um, not terrible, we had this service as they left uh, to go home to their families uh, with the Bishop of Pretoria wept and they wept and it was it was a, one of the most dreadful days of my life really watching that but a few months later was the first anniversary the commemoration uh, of it and i tentatively put to them do you think one of you could just speak Fifteen thousand people there and this woman marched forward and put her name down and then another one came and eight of them came and betty guadalia she spoke and she spoke as the people speak in South Africa, and she was up a mandla, and she spoke with confidence. And they all speak with confidence now, complete confidence, and these are the people who are gonna fight uh, for the justice. What you should know about corporate responsibility, uh, though, is this, that these people were left without a rand, absolutely nothing, and Lonman refused to give them anything at all until at the end of the day, after two years, we forced them to give every member of the family, or at least every family, at least one job, but the women took the job, and you listen again to Betty Guadalia, who talks about being three kilometers down that mine, humping 25 kilo sacks of cement in order to try and feed the family that her husband fed back in the Eastern uh, Cape. This is corporate responsibility uh, that you get. So there we go. I just want to make one other point, which uh, perhaps comes to think. You'd think you'd learn a lesson, wouldn't you? I mean, it is horrible. I mean, I saw it on television in London, people being mowed down. You know, having been an anti-apartheid supporter all my life, since 1960 when I was a child, and my father, who's a coal miner, took that. Lots of people, I mean, got it. You'd think they'd learn. No, no, no. After Marikana, I killed three agricultural workers in the Western Cape who are on strike. I mean, they're on strike for absolutely nothing. They learn nothing. The police officers who fire on automatic mode, they're still in post. The damning report against the generals, they're still in post as we sit here tonight. Piega, the national commissioner, she's still in post. Nobody gets, you'd think they'd learn something. You'd think they'd learn something. And that is really a bad omen for South Africa. I'd like to respond yeah, to definitely. the question yeah. about um, the left and trade unions. Um, the tripartite alliance during the democratic era has meant that the ANC's pursued this broad church of ideology church you create a power vacuum because you're not left you're not right you're trying to make all of these people happy and this power vacuum has created um, a, you know some of the issues in terms of implementation delivery and also in parties like the EFF but because the the EFF itself doesn't have proper policy um, it, it will also unravel is my prediction in the next in the next while or at least lose a, a big share of the vote this in turn will create further leftist movements and further what some people call proto-fascist parties. I use that word very, very um, carefully. In terms of if RV wanted to come to the United Kingdom and an audience for him, the World Economic Forum offers as an inhibitor to competitiveness. Um, when strike season happens, I mean, this, this is, you know, on the one hand, the country has the best protection of workers, um, in comparison to other countries in the world. But when we talk about competitiveness in terms of jobs in the global economies, um, investors are not happy <coughs> with this. But I suppose if Bobby could get, give some indication of what is happening in the trade union um, landscape in South Africa and how that tripartite alliance might play out towards the next election, that is something that would definitely be valuable. Okay. Andrew, you wanted a word. The, the difficulty is that political discourse as we know it has shifted so far to the right, generally, that what we talk about, you know, to describe Kasatu as a leftist movement, <laughs> it hasn't been a leftist movement for years and years. And it's why there's been a split and why there's been a breakaway. The difficulty that the emergence of any left movement in South Africa has, exactly what we're seeing in Greece today. You know, the, the reality is that there are extraordinarily powerful interest groups that control political and economic processes globally to extents that I think we often aren't aware of in, in our daily lives. And that's the difficulty that any left movement in South Africa will have. It will undoubtedly 
it, it will appeal to people who do feel frustrated. It will appeal to workers who feel unrepresented. It will appeal to unemployed people. Whether the leadership emerging, which includes Vavi and Irvin Jim and others, have the organizational abilities to actually do something important politically with that frustration remains to be seen. I would hope so, but it's very difficult to know whether that would be the case. But what is absolutely fundamental, and it's, you know, we see it in a perhaps a, a raw form in South Africa, but again, it applies is this issue of accountability and representation. I mean, who here can honestly feel, after an election in this country, that they feel represented by the person they voted for? You know, the reality is that the link between a professional political class and the electorate and taxpayers has become such a distant one and such an unhinged one that that is the problem. You know, before Marikana, tragically, Thabo Mbeki's AIDS denialism created the avoidable deaths of hundreds and hundreds of thousands of South Africans, according to the School of Public Health at Harvard University. He was prepared to spend six and a half billion pounds that the country didn't need and barely uses, but he wasn't prepared to spend a cent of state money providing antiretrovirals to keep six million South Africans who were living with HIV or AIDS alive. What accountability was there for that? What accountability is there for Marikana, as people have said, and it reminds me as my final point, of something that Vaclav Havel said, the former dissident president of, of Czechoslovakia and the Czech Republic. He had a toothache, and he said to his assistant, cancel my meetings this afternoon. I've got to go across Prague to the dentist. And his assistant said to him, Mr. President, you no longer go to the dentist. The dentist comes to you because you can't afford the time to get across the city, wait, etc., etc. He wrote a little book called Summer Meditations in the first summer when he'd been president for about six months to a year, in which he says it was at this moment that it dawned on him the privileges of being in power. And he said the fundamental problem is that the vast majority of leaders and politicians in the world today want to be in power because of those privileges rather than accept the privileges because of what it enables them to do for the people who elected them to be there. And that's the problem of South Africa, but it goes beyond South Africa. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. I have no intentions of uh, answering a question with a question. <laughs> However, I mean, I'm trying to figure out, I mean, I've just uh, clearly uh, stated right at the beginning that, I mean, uh, there's an ANC in government, there's an ANC out of government. And I'm sure you're quite aware of, I mean, having been in South Africa and within the structures um, that actually function in a country, you should be aware of that difference. I mean, I'm just trying to figure out, did you, in the process of uh, acquiring all the information and writing up the, the document, I mean, approach the ANC and their position in relation to the incident in Marikana? No, 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 I'm talking, the I'm talking about the executive of the ANC in yeah. the country. Cyril Ramaphosa is a deputy president. Yeah. So you wouldn't have asked no. deputy president because he would be talking on behalf of the government. I'm talking about the ANC in government yes. and the ANC out of government. We, I was going to continue. We asked yes. Cyril. We also asked the ANC, um, or I asked the ANC for any colloquial response. And they just pointed us towards the official statement that we already made on the matter. So they couldn't comment further because it's part of the Okay, no. I know I just wanted to make that clarification that, I mean, I think if you wanted the position of the ANC, you should have gone to the ANC yeah. itself, because I, I'm, I'm quite aware that they actually issued a statement. I mean, it's not a very long statement, but the statement was briefly saying they accepted the outcomes of the inquiry. I mean, because um, obviously mm -hmm. they wouldn't actually question that. that. We, we were there before, the, well, we were there last year, so this yeah. is before the inquiry was reported. Yeah. So that, you know, that, that, but they, the point is they didn't engage with this issue. They okay. didn't yeah, Jabba, do you, do you think that, that people still support the ANC because it was the dream, uh, that's what liberated them and therefore they owe their, or, or is it because they, the ANC as a party can deliver things to people on the ground today? A bit of both. Yeah? Yes, ANC has been um, 
I mean, I grew up in the ANC myself. <laughs> and it, it is this machinery that actually, actually helped people to move out of what was created in the past. <coughs> you know, and it's still there. And the ANC will still continue to ensure that, I mean, it actually empowers the people of South Africa. I mean, it's not, it's not that well or everything has been achieved. It's still, in, it's still a process of achieving that, but I can confirm that the ANC will continue to embark on projects that are intended to empower the South African communities. You know, the ANC will continue to develop policies that will address issues which are still in Africa today, which issues like, um, which I mentioned earlier, inequalities, unemployment, poverty, it still prevails in South Africa and we accept that. And it's our responsibility in the ANC to develop policies and make sure that we empower our government. And in terms of opposition, probably let me just say, I mean, it's got a very kind of like a, a difficult political landscape. I think South African politics have always been uh, along color lines, let me put it that way. So, I mean, we accept that the minorities in South Africa, which are the whites, I mean, they're quite few. I mean, they don't pose a threat in terms of, you know, developing a very strong opposition. However, I do accept the tactics of bringing in uh, guys like Musi Maiman and bring him into the, the opposition and hoping that you'll get a fair share of uh, black South Africans to probably... Oh, okay. They've partially achieved that, I think, in the last elections, <laughs> you know, and I mean... I don't want to quote a, a, a play by saying, I mean, ANC, it, I mean, it's kind of like a factory. I mean, it's, it's actually, you know, it's a machinery. It produces, you know, politicians and it, you know, and every factory has its fault, you know, and <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so if there are, you know, factory faults within the ANC and then they go and, and establish other parties somewhere or, they, or probably they move to the left. I mean, they still share the ideals of the African National Congress. Which are, which are very good. Yeah. I, Okay, let's have a last round of questions because we're going to have to... Yes, the gentleman over there. Yep. Yeah, I just think that um, the Democratic Alliance calling for more foreign investment is like Turkey's calling for more Christmas. You know, it's the problem started long before apartheid with British co corporations in the 1890s and the gold fields. And I think that the whole issue of corporate as well as the accountability of the ANC. And the first one is what we can do more about here. I mean, corporate social responsibility is about corporations monitoring themselves. Farlam was about the ANC government monitoring itself. What we need is the political imagination to set up more popular forms of mobilization. Go back to the basics, which the ANC started with. We need to mobilize, especially here, for corporate accountability. I mean, there is an issue of leaving the process in South Africa to the, the South African people to sort out their government and so on. But what we have the moral and put responsibility and political possibility of doing is campaigning about corporate responsibility. And that, okay. but, uh, yeah. corporate accountability, if you excuse me, right. Thank you. Uh, the, yes, the lady in the orange shirt, thank you. It's interesting, it's actually a bit of a follow on from that. I think, Jack, you said earlier that South Africa has 90% of the world's platinum, is that right? So I in that case, it's really different from coal or from gold in South Africa. Why doesn't the government hold these platinum companies responsible? Mm -hmm. If South Africa has a near monopoly on this commodity, which we all need for every device that we own, it's a massive opportunity. And I, I struggle to understand why, why not. OK, thank you. Uh, yes, the lady here, and then the last question over there. Yes, I, I was also interested in raising the corporate social responsibility question. Sorry, can you hold the microphone? Sorry, I was also question. interested in raising the corporate social responsibility question because it seems to me that that is one of the most vital things that needs to be developed in South Africa, particularly with its, with its history, but even, even globally. Um, the resource wars that have happened um, and the OECD's guidelines for, say, conflict minerals, the Kimberley process, all show a, a, a change in process and a, a, a global demand or a stronger demand from consumers for corporate responsibility. 
and a connection between what's happening in South Africa and what happens when you go and buy, say, a platinum ring in a jewellery store or a car with a catalytic converter. You know, so the, the possibility is there to raise these links, and they're now mainstream and much more legitimate than they were 20 years ago. So I, I, th I think there's some, there are a lot of possibilities in going down those routes. <coughs> OK. Yeah, and the gentleman over there. That they've had in Latin America for some time the Bolivarian Alliance, which is a recognition that one country can't go it alone against these kind of global forces. And I think the problem for this discussion is it's far too focused on South Africa and what South Africa can do on its own. This whole global situation is now is a continuance of colonialism. The alliance between the state and big business was the essence of colonialism going all the way back to the East India Company and the colonization of India. That's what it's all about. There's nothing new about this. But the struggle against apartheid was internationalized, and it was internationalized because there was a widespread international consciousness that supported decolonization in all sorts of areas of the world. And anti-apartheid was a paradigmatic example of that struggle. Now, what seems to be missing is an internationalization of the struggle of the grassroots struggles in South Africa and linking it up with other parts of Africa, the Middle East and Latin America and probably Southeast Asia as well. So it's a, it's a global problem, and it's about corporate social responsibility. And I think this is going to have to be the last round of comments from our panel. So uh, I think we'll just go in the same, in the same <coughs> order. Uh, so why don't they hold them to account when there's 90%? Well, because of the 90% uh, in London, 18% is owned by Sir Ramaphosa. Uh, so that's one good reason uh, why they will not hold them to account. And that is typically what's happened in South Africa, where the new elite that has emerged since apartheid have now integrated themselves into the old white system. Uh, so if you want to write to Cyril Ramaphosa, very easy to do it. Care of McDonald's, South Africa. He owns 100% of the franchise of South African uh, McDonald's. And this is the scheme of things uh, throughout. So I think there's no uh, difficulty there. <coughs> The whole business of colonialism and the attitude of the ANC was summed up uh, for me when I listened to uh, the president of the new union, uh, the, the uh, AMCU, when they were talking about uh, Cecil Rhodes. And there's been this huge thing in South Africa or uh, a move in South Africa to get rid of the statue of Cecil Rhodes from uh, the universities, uh, and in particular in Cape Town, in which the uh, ANC have been very vocal in supporting it, saying, yeah, Get rid of this statue. Get it out. It represents the past. And Joseph Mutunja says, that's a good idea, and I support that. The problem is that when I try to get rid of colonialism in the past in the Lonman mine, there is no one here from the ANC to support it. And I think that, that's really quite telling. So they're quite happy to do that then. Not, not very happy at all about taking on uh, the big multinational uh, companies. Um, my own view is I said that South Africa has not changed. I think that Marikana. Uh, has changed it forever. And one of the things that I learned quite recently was after that slaughter, after the slaughter, the remnants of the Shop Stewards Committee went back to the mountain where the people had been killed on the 16th of August, and they resolved that they would fight on for a living wage. And so they did uh, until the 23rd of September, uh, some weeks later, when they actually won that strike. So for me, the spirit of Manakara lives on like that. And I think that one day there will be justice for the people of Marikana. Disney. Hi, I'd like to respond to the gentleman over there um, and the history of corporate legal personality, which is really a fundamental concept in terms of how all of these things can take place in the global economy, um, and also why directors' responsibility for the actions of corporate is charged. And then um, related to that as well is the extent of corporate legal machinery in relation to the power that is held by small, poor countries in an In my work, uh, we travel a lot into Africa, and we talk about private sector investments. We speak to governments, we speak to corporations, and we listen to all the different arguments. And really, one of the takeaways for me um, from a recent visit into southern Africa is that governments there 
being caught between this tension of needing to attract the investment and then multinational con uh, companies due to the legal machinery that they have being able to dictate the terms of the, those contracts. And this is something that um, we all need to think about with its services society. And then finally, um, a point was made by the lady in orange over there about um, South Africa holding 90% of the world's platinum and, and can't the government in some way um, have stronger bargaining power in this regard. The issue that I just spoke to about beneficiation and value add um, is very strong on the agenda for, for um, developing countries with mineral resources. Uh, multinationals often don't react well to this because they see it as nationalization or a threat of expropriation of property rights. They will cite Zimbabwe as an example. Um, this is a very complicated issue. Um, but just in closing, the editor of Business Day said in relation to the nationalization debate, the shares of Lonmin at the moment are really quite depressed following all of this. So why doesn't the government buy Lonmin? Interesting thought. Hmm. Andrew. Just very quickly, I mean, Jim answered the question that the, 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 the lady in orange posed. It's because of co-option. It's because of the fact that Cyril Ramaphosa, who's a multi-billionaire, served on the board of Lonman as a non-executive director, very influential figure within the ANC, now the party and the country's deputy president, like the president. Um, it's why the rules for business haven't changed, despite the political change in South Africa. Um, and I think that the only way that, that one can address these sorts of issues is to ask whether our politics work anymore because I don't believe that liberal democratic politics, which I certainly came to accept many years ago as probably the best form of governance we have, is simply not working for far too many people. <coughs> One in four children in the United Kingdom who lives in poverty has both parents working, but they don't earn enough money to keep their families out of poverty. That can't be right. And, you know, Nigel, you said, well, what can we do about it? In terms of South Africa, in after the party, I wrote a final chapter on specifically what I think needs to change politically in South Africa um, for the country to function better and for there to be more accountability. So go back to that, and then I'd love to have the discussion. Globally, I think the first place we have to start is we've got to get corporate money out of politics. I think that it completely undermines the functioning of the market. I think it's terrible for business, and I think it's awful for the way that we are governed. But the reality is there is more and more money in politics rather than the other way around. Because it's only when there's less corporate money in politics that ordinary people can actually have a say in what their representatives do and how they're governed. I think the lady at the back mentioned um, inadvertently the issue of consumer power. You know, we actually do have powers as consumers. And I think we are often too passive as citizens. We say, you know, what do politicians want from us? They want our votes and they want our tax pounds. And we hand them over willingly. We get the vote every now and then, and that's it. Then we leave them to their own devices. We pay our taxes, even if they're used for yet another arms deal with Saudi Arabia, because there's a new seven billion pound arms deal happening at the moment. And again, there'll be you know somewhere between 15 and 30% of that will go in bribes. But we don't do anything about it. We go and vote next time we're allowed to. But we as citizens also need to take some responsibility and say, well, if we don't like the nature of our politics today, what can we do together to change the nature of those politics? And it's only in that way in South Africa. And I do believe this is the thing that I feel very strongly about South Africa. It, it remains a highly politicized society. You know, there are literally there are thousands and thousands of social protests in South Africa every day against basic local level corruption and lack of service delivery. And that gives me hope that while it will take time, eventually the unaccountable way in which the ANC currently operates in South Africa will not be sustainable. And I hope that Marikana, the tragedy of Marikana, can be an important stepping stone in that process. Jabu, would you agree with that? The local, the, the <coughs> local is important. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I do agree with that. 
that's quite true. And I think it's been a learning curve mm. you know, for the ANC government. And I think part of the main cornerstone of the ANC government was the issues about honesty, about transparent, transparency, about responsibility and accountability. And I quite accept that perhaps those key elements have not been very, very conspicuous in the running of the government. And I think it's the responsibility of the government to revisit its, um, you know, its founding policies and, and, and principles. And having said that, I mean, I think it's also our responsibility in the ANC to continue our work as the African National, con to conscientize the, you know, the, the South Africans, you know, to understand the legacy of uh, the founding principles of the ANC as an organization and what it stands for. It is unfortunate that uh, probably in this, the unfolding of the political scenario in South Africa, we particularly post uh, the, demo uh, 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 the democratic elections in 1990, there was a lot of kind of like what I probably would uh, refer to as political careerism, which then actually saw most of these principles that were so well developed, so well thought of getting compromised. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's, it's usual in uh, meetings for to announce the next meeting, and I, but nobody's given me one for, <laughs> for here. So I'm going to use this slot to just to tell you that the uh, the RAS, which is the Royal African Society, though uh, some people have called it the, the Radical African Society <laughs> because we've livened it up a bit. Uh, the speaker at the annual lecture later this year is going to be Musi Maimani. So uh, watch out for the date. We haven't quite <laughs> fixed the date yet, but we're close to it. So just have a look at our, follow our website, and uh, he'll, be the, the, he'll give the annual lecture this year. You've been a fantastic audience. The, the level of questions has been terrific. But please also thank the panel and uh, congratulate yourself. It's been a great evening. <laughs>